Spirit of God flow in us and in His church. Let us come together as one to worship the risen King. Jesus. When night is falling, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it. to me now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up you won't give up on me you won't give up on me So we just got through, just a couple weeks ago, celebrating the 4th of July. And with all that we've been through in the past year, it was kind of nice to be able to celebrate kind of a normal holiday. But the 4th of July always brings out kind of the, the weirdest and the, the worst in some people. Um, it is kinda, it's funny how people somehow always end up blowing their hands off with fireworks or just doing stupid things sometimes even without the influence of alcohol somehow. Uh, I can even think of my own life how uh, going to Fort July parties, you know, thinking about how my friends, you know, were doing, you know, doing bottle rocket wars, shooting bottle rockets at everybody, 
or somehow one, one year we had a tree catch on fire. But the thing that I always remember about Fourth of July in terms of just people being stupid is just a few years ago, um, I was at a friend's house for Fourth of July, and for some reason, somebody had a bright idea. You know those little, those little popper things that we use, you throw them at the ground, they make a little popping sound. That we were just throwing them at each other, which is not a good idea. But one of my friends had this bright idea that he wanted to somebody to take a handful of those little popper things and just throw it at him. And he dared, he dared people to do it. He even turned, took his shirt off and bared his back and said, throw it at me. And someone else actually did the same thing. So one of my other friends decided, okay, you want to do that? You really want to do that? He took a handful of those things and chucked them as hard as he could at my other friend's back. Now, if you look online or on these, the website for these little popper things, the company that makes them, they will tell you that they're completely safe and they're harmless. But I'm here to tell you that's, that's a lie. Because what happens when you take a handful of those things and you chuck it at somebody as hard as you can is pain. So what happened was, because he threw them as hard as he can at somebody's bare back, welts started to, come, started to pop up almost instantly. And he was in a tremendous amount of pain. And I, of course, being the friend that I was, was standing over the side, howling in laughter at the just stupidity of my friend. And if we were honest about ourselves, and we had this kind of line, this grading scale for how stupid we can be. Oftentimes we're pretty stupid, but most of the time we're rational adults. That doesn't do those really stupid things that pop up in the news with people blowing their hands off with fireworks. We're doing really stupid things. But we would say that we're pretty good on the stupid, the stupid scale, that we're pretty good. But the thing is, if we applied the same kind of scale to our moral decisions and, that, and all the things that we do, what kind of grade would we give ourselves? What kind of grade did we deserve in terms of our moral goodness? And tonight, today, what I want to talk about, as we're going through this series on the fruits of the Spirit, found in Galatians 5, 20, 5.22, is talk about one of those fruits of the Spirit, goodness. Now, just as a, re a reminder of the passage that we're going through in this series, I just want to read it once again. And that's Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, the purpose of this passage is not really to do what we're doing here, to, to, piece, to pick apart all these different words and try to describe them. What Paul is giving is a broad overview of what a life looks like if it's totally surrendered to God and totally inhabited by the Spirit of God in their life. And the one that we're going to be looking at today is goodness. Now, I've been in church most of my life, and I've been familiar with this passage. I probably sat through sermon series just like this one on these fruits of the Spirit. But to be honest, when I read through these, goodness is not always the one that jumps out to me. There are other ones that I kind of have better grip on and trying to understand, and there are some that I concentrate more on because I struggle with them. But goodness kind of gets lost in the mix sometimes when reading this, this verse. And I think that has a lot to do with our society's understanding of goodness and the idea of being good. Because when it comes to English, which is most of our first language, which most of the, our first language, the idea of good is, is this broad spectrum that every reference in the Bible, every concept, every inkling of this idea of good is all jammed in this one English word. That we truly, really, at most times, don't have a good grip on. 
It can be anything and everything in English can be good. Anything from a burrito to a, a human being can be classified as good. And even in terms of scale and what good means, it can mean anything from average, which is what we usually use it for, like this is good, it's okay, to something that is good. It's really good. Just by the inflection of our voice, this word just changes tremendously. So we can, it, it, in many ways, it loses all meaning. People ask you, how are you doing? You say good. But in Scripture, that's not what good means. And just as a broad overview, I mean, we could spend countless time talking about the word good in Scripture. But the idea generally in Scripture when you're talking about good is two things. One, talking about a descriptor, that adjective form, like you know, this land is good, this food is good. These things are good. And what that means is that they're over and above average. They're a blessing. There's something that is of quality. But the second use of this idea of good in Scripture is the one we're talking about today, and it's the one that's truly and utterly important. And that is the idea of moral good, which is perfect through and through. It means a, it means a quality of person, a quality of moral righteousness that is over and above the norm. And that's what we are called to. But the problem is, Scripture is clear, only God is good. Romans 3.10 and 3.10 through 12 tells us, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Not even one. No one on this earth who has ever lived aside from Jesus has ever been good. Not you, not your grandma, not your mom, not your dad, not the best person, not your best friend, not the best person that you can think of. It's good. No, it says no one, the Bible says basically no one even tries to be good. We're so inept at it, we're so impossibly far away from it, that we can't even get close to attaining it. Because good is a descriptor for God and the quality of God. And God is good to the infinite amount, and that is a standard. And, the, and our goodness maxes out at so little that it doesn't even, it's not even a drop in the bucket. We cannot be good. And sometimes, we're, most times, people are, are so far in the opposite form of good that not even tr it doesn't even look like they're trying to be good. We know how evil people can be and how evil people generally are. That, according to scripture at least, is the norm of what humanity is. People can, are capable of doing such terrible things. We can look to scripture. We can look to the news. Even people that claim to be good or claim to be doing good work. I mean, 10, de 10 years down the road, we find out they were utterly corrupt. They were utterly evil. Mankind is hopelessly not good. But the good news is, pun intended, that the primary way that God is described as being good in Scripture is because of the fact that He is good to us in the things that He gives us, in the fact that He gives generously to us. That is the primary way that God's goodness is, is described in Scripture. James 1.17 tells us, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, 
coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Not only is God good, he is good consistently, all the time. He's good in his mercy and everything that he gives us, but specifically to start off with, God is good in the fact that he sent his son to die for us. And because of that, and through that, he has given us his spirit to live in our life if we believe in him, we trust him, and we open our lives to him, and to the word that he has in our lives through his spirit. At that point, and for the only time in our life, we then can start to do good. Because apart from God, we can do no good. But through God, we can do good. And we can show the goodness that's described in Galatians 5. But the word specifically here that we see in Galatians 5 for goodness is a unique word that's not found outside of Scripture, and it's only found in the New Testament four times, including the passage in Galatians, four, in Galatians 5. And it's a word, and the meaning of which we'll get to in a minute, is perfectly described in another passage in the New Testament. A more famous passage from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and describing to his disciples what their lives should look like. And he says this in Matthew 5, starting in verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and good glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, the first thing that I kind of want to look at as, as we spend the rest of our time looking at this passage, the first thing that I want us to see from this passage when it comes to goodness that Jesus is saying that goodness is not something that you do. It's something that you are. The wording here is very clear. It says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. When God comes into us through his spirit, when he, when he inhabits us, if we believe in him and trust in him, we become those things. In fact, this passage that we're looking at comes right after the group of, I mean, the scripture known as the Beatitudes, which is ironically very similar to the passage that we're looking at in Galatians 5. And in many ways, it's just, it's less a, a list of things to try and do than the things that if you are a follower of Christ, if you are inhabited by his spirit, are things that you value, are things that you believe in, things that you unintentionally do that are part of who you are. That when you become part of Christ's family, that you become filled with his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness. These are things that you become, things that you are. And in the same way, we become good when we are filled with him. Because it's not our goodness, because we're not capable of goodness. But God fills us to the point that in our day-to-day -day lives, when we do things, when we, do, when we go to the store, when we go to work, when we interact with our classmates, when we interact with our family members, when we interact with strangers in the street, we inhabit goodness we show goodness because that is what is inside of us. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Salt cannot not be salt. 
Light cannot not be light. It is what it is. Salt, you have one sodium and one chloride, and it's salt. And it does everything that salt is supposed to do as long as it is salt. Light is light. We know what light is when you see it. It cannot not be light. It is what it is. So must it be with us. We must inhabit goodness. We must do good things because it comes out of who we are because of what Christ has made us to be, because of what he inhabits us to be. We show goodness because God has made us to be good through his power and not our own. But the second thing I want us to see in this Matthew 5 passage is that goodness is meant to be seen. Now, this is a very touchy thing that we have to kind of look at. But it's clear, God, Jesus is saying, you do these good things so people will see them. But in the, in the very next chapter of Matthew, Jesus condemns the idea of, of doing righteous things so everyone will look at you. Everyone will see it. So what's the difference? Jesus says later that, you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when you're doing good things for other people. So what is the difference? Are we meant to show what's good about us because of God to others or not? The thing I think it implies here is that when we do these good works so other people will see them, it's not a, hey, look at me situation. It's not, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing, so hey, are you looking? Because I'm about to do something. Uh, are you, gonna, you, see, you, you see me? Because I'm about to do something cool here. That's not what this is because that is sinful, and Jesus condemns that. And it, it doesn't mean that doing good things that are not seen is somehow less or not as important, because Jesus commands us to, to pray. Jesus commands us to seek our Father in a quiet room, to study his word, to know his word. And those are, the, those are things that are generally done in privacy. So those things are not not good. But the specific type of goodness that Jesus is talking about is a goodness that is meant to be seen by others. It's meant to be shown and shared. And the difference, I think, is kind of simple. Is that when you do something that's good, when you do something that you know to be right, that God has instructed you to do, that you... that you are filled in your heart and you know that God has told you this thing is right. Do you do it with someone watching so, you, so that they know that you're doing the right thing? Hey, look at me, I'm doing the right thing. Or do you do it when someone is watching so that they know this is the right thing? This is the good thing. Because one is about you and what you can do and what you inhabit, that you are good. But the other is that the thing that God has told you to do, the the thing that God has shown you to do, that is what's good. Because it's coming from God and not from you. If you are filled with God's Spirit, it will be seen. If God works in your life and does things in your life and inhabits your life and you value the things that God values, if you value love, joy, patience, kindness, and all these things, if you value the things in the Beatitude, brokenness, mourning, people that are broken, if you value those things, your actions, your right actions, your good actions that come from God will be seen. You notice salt when it's there. If salt is in food, you're going to know it's there. If salt is preserving something, you're going to know it's there because it is being preserved. When light is in the room, you automatically know it. And not only do you know that you know it, you know what the source is. If you walk into a room and it's lit, your eyes automatically go to where the light is coming from. The human eye is drawn toward light. 
The human tongue can sense salt. So it is with all good things from God. When you do good things that God has commanded you to do, it will be seen because it is good. You notice when it's there. Because here's the thing. This little word, goodness, that's described in Galatians 5.22. It's a specific type of goodness, as I've said. It's not just the moral goodness that is God. It's, a, it's the moral goodness that is God that is directed in a specific way. It is directed in a specific way as seen in Matthew 5. We're just talking about the fact that goodness is for the benefit of others. What that word goodness means in Galatians 5 is that you do these good things, you do these godly things for the benefit of others. Goodness for others. Not goodness for goodness sake, it's goodness for others. You're not doing good things just to do them. It's not that good things for their own sake are wrong. It's that that's not how God does good things. God doesn't just do good things and go, oh, that's a good thing. God does good things. Remember what we talked about, the chief way that God is described as being good in the Bible is that he is good in the way that he gives us good things. And that is what this word means here. And that is what is described in, in Matthew 5. Because the thing that people kind of often misunderstand when it talks about you are to be good, you are to do these things, is that it's not a list of things to be done. These things, doing these things, does not make you morally good. It does not make you morally better than anyone around you. You do these things because God has already made you better. That he's indwelled in you. That he's filled you with himself. And then therefore, you go out and you do these good things for others. It's like 1 John 4, 19. It says, we love because he first loved us. And to turn that phrase around, we give because he first gave to us. We are good to others because God was first good to us. We love others because God first loved us. We show others peace because God gave us the ultimate peace. We are patient with others because God is infinitely patient with us. We are kind to others because God is infinitely kind to us. We are gentle with others that don't deserve it because God is infinitely gentle with us. We do the good things that God has placed in our life to do, the right things. so that others will see God through us. Because God is so good to us, we show his goodness to others for his glory. That is the whole point. That is the whole purpose of the goodness that Paul describes in Galatians 5. It's not goodness just to be good. It's not just simply doing the right things, checking off the right boxes. It is a pattern after God. Remember what, it's, remember what I talked about when we were talking about the Old Testament, that the idea of God's goodness is that he gives good things to us. So we pattern ourselves in this way after God, not that we are God, not that we are good like God, but because God is good to us, we in turn do good things for others, and we show other, we show God's love, God's mercy, God's righteousness, God's justice to other people, 
so that they may see God and then in turn glorify him. And the cycle is supposed to continue. You show goodness so people see God. So they sh- become followers of his. So they show goodness so others can see God, glorify him, follow him, and show goodness to others. That is the pattern that Jesus is laying out. That's what goodness means in Galatians 5. We are filled with God's goodness by his spirit. This is the fruit that we are given. The ability to to do good to others as only God can by showing others himself. So where does that leave us? How do we apply, apply that to our lives, the things that we do? What are some things to think about? I think it kind of implies that we need to be better. I know I have to be better at thinking about what the results of my actions are in people's lives. How do I treat people that don't know God? How do I interact with them? How do I interact with people that claim to know God but don't live like it? What are the things I need to say? What are the things I need to do? What are the things I need to demonstrate? Because I know I don't think about it enough. I know I don't do that enough. I need to be better about being filled with God's spirit, but being filled with his word so that I know and innately understand the good and the right thing to do in every situation, in every interaction, every word, every deed. There might be some people watching this who have never felt or understood that goodness. You've been trying to do good. You've been trying to be the good person your entire life. And it just doesn't ever seem to work out the way that you want or the way that seems fulfilling. I'll tell you that you're trying to do something without being connected to the source that gives it life. You can't do it. You simply can't. And you have to be surrendered to the one who can and believe that he came and he died for you and he wants to live inside you and beside you so that you can truly do good and show that goodness to others. But the, for those of us who are watching, who have experienced that goodness that God provides, that do understand it. But if we're honest like me, that we haven't been good at it, that we haven't been good at letting the Spirit fill us and let it run our lives, that we don't value the things that God values the way that we should. And because of that, our actions are most of the time worth, worthless in terms of the goodness that we can show. 